Good morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. My name is Frank Wade. I'm the interim dean of this cathedral, and it is my honor to thank you for allowing Washington National Cathedral to fulfill part of its mission as a spiritual home for the nation. It is important at times like this to have places like this where we can, in fact, hold before God our grief, our joy, our thanksgiving, and our hope. For all of us as a nation participated, no matter how vicariously, in the great explorations of Neil Armstrong and his companions. And so it is important for us as a nation, as a community, as a people, to gather here in this place to consider the mysteries of creation, of life, of death, and also to give thanks for a life well lived and for service boldly rendered. That's what we'll be doing in this time, and I thank you for sharing in it. May I call your attention to the order of service before you. Glorify God, all you works of God. We pray in, honor in the high vault of heaven, glorify God. We pray in the honor God of grace and glory, you create and sustain the universe in majesty and beauty. We thank you for all in whom you have planted the desire to know your creation and to explore your work and your wisdom. Lead us, like them, to understand better the wonder and mystery of creation. Through Christ, your eternal word, through whom all things were made. Amen. Those who came before us made certain that this country rode the first waves of the Industrial Revolution the first waves of modern invention, and the first wave of nuclear power. And this generation does not intend to founder in the backwash of the coming age of space. We mean to be a part of it. We mean to lead it. For the eyes of the world, now look into space, to the moon and to the planets beyond. And we have vowed that we shall not see it governed by a hostile flag of conquest, but by a banner of freedom and peace. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. Many years ago, the great British explorer George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said because it is there. Well, space is there. And we're going to climb it. And the moon and the planets are there. And new hopes for knowledge and peace are there. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. Thank you. Members of the Armstrong family, Bishop Buddy, friends here gathered today. When President Kennedy challenged this nation to be first on the moon in his historic Rice University speech 50 years ago today, yesterday, many thought it was an impossible dream. But the vision of that young president was rooted in the knowledge that the American experiment itself was an incredible miracle. The miracle of America was only made possible by men and women of uncommon foresight, determination, and courage, who dared to turn the once impossible dream of freedom, equality, and democracy into a new and enduring reality. That legacy inspired a young Neil Armstrong to first interrupt his studies at Purdue University to serve his country as a Navy fighter pilot. He would later become a NASA astronaut 
first in the Gemini program and later in Apollo. But he never forgot his Navy roots and naval aviation heritage as he lived out his life as an active member of the Golden Eagles. Right after President Kennedy's speech, Neil was already working on the problem of how to land a flying machine on the moon. Those of us who have had the privilege to fly in space followed the trail he helped forge. America's leadership in space and the confidence that we can go farther into the unknown and achieve great things as a people rests with the achievements of Neil and the brave men with whom he served. Neil will always be remembered for taking humankind's first small step on a world beyond our own. But it was courage, grace, and humility he displayed throughout his life that lifted him above the stars. Neil Armstrong left more than footprints and a flag on the moon. In fact, as President Obama said in a letter to Carol and the family this morning, future generations will draw inspiration from his spirit of discovery, humble composure, and pioneering leadership in setting a bold new course for space exploration. The imprint he left on the surface of the moon and the story of human history is matched only by the extraordinary mark he left on the hearts of all Americans." Unquote. He left a foundation for the future and paved the way for future American explorers to be first to step foot on Mars or another planet. Today, let us recommit ourselves to this grand challenge in honor of the man who first demonstrated it was possible to reach new worlds and whose life demonstrated the quiet resolve and determination that makes every new, more difficult step into space possible. I was proud to know Neil Armstrong as a fellow astronaut, a trusted advisor, and a friend. It was my honor to share in the moment with the entire Apollo 11 crew and Senator John Glenn in Washington last fall as they received the Congressional Gold Medal. It was the last time Neil made a public appearance in Washington, and ever true to his nature, he spoke not on his, his own behalf, but accepted the medal as I, and I quote, on behalf of his fellow Apollo teammates, all those who played a role in expanding human presence outward from Earth, and all those who played a role in expanding human knowledge of the solar system and beyond, unquote. As we take the next giant leap forward in human exploration of the heavens, we stand on the shoulders of a true American hero. On the south side of this sacred place, there is a special window, a space window, which holds a piece of the moon rock Neil and the Apollo 11 crew presented to the National Cathedral many years ago. It's a reminder not only of their significant human accomplishment, but an acknowledgment that achievements are made possible through God's grace and guiding hand. As Neil took his first steps on the moon, nervous but excited NASA workers in Houston's Mission Control Center waited to hear his now famous words from the lunar surface. Today, we shall share a small token of our esteem by presenting to you, Carol, and the Armstrong family, the flag that flew over the Johnson Space Center's mission control on August 25th, the day of Neil's passing. I join a grateful nation in saluting a brave and humble servant who never stopped dreaming, never stop working to make those dreams reality and inspired each and every one of us. May God bless Neil Armstrong and may God bless these United States of America.
Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then God said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on the count of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the, Israeli, of the Israelites have come to, has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign for you that, is, that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title to all generations. The word of the Lord.
how does one adequately express his feelings about a special friend? When that friend is also a world icon, a national hero of unimaginable proportion, and a legend whose name will live in history long after all here today have been forgotten. A friend whose commitment and dedication to that in which he believed was absolute. A man who, when he became your friend, was a friend for a lifetime. I am not sure this is possible, but I will try. Neil Armstrong grew up on a farm in middle America. And as a young boy, like most kids, he had a paper route. He cut lawns. He shoveled snow. And his fascination for model airplanes gave birth to a dream, a dream of becoming an aeronautical engineer. Neil had his first taste of flight when he was but six years old. And from that day forward, he never looked back. Although he always wanted to design and redesign airplanes to make them do what they weren't supposed to do, once he had tasted flight, Neil's eyes turned skyward, and it was there that he always longed to be. Little did Neil ever realize that his dream, his longing to soar with the eagles, would someday give him the opportunity to be the first human being to go where no human had gone before. Neil Armstrong was a sincerely humble man of impeccable integrity who reluctantly accepted his role as the first human being to walk on another world. And when he did, he became a testament, a testament to all Americans of what can be achieved through vision and dedication. But in Neil's mind, it was never about Neil. It was about you, your mothers and fathers, your grandparents, about those of a generation ago who gave Neil the opportunity to call the moon his home. But never, ever was it about Neil. Neil considered that he was just the tip of the arrow, always giving way to some 400,000 equally committed and dedicated Americans, who Americans who were the strength behind the bow and always giving credit to those who just didn't know it couldn't be done. And therein lies the strength and the character of Neil Armstrong. He knew who he was, and he understood the immensity of what he had done. Yet Neil was always willing to give of himself. When Neil, Jim Lovell, and I had the opportunity to visit the trips in Iraq and Afghanistan on three separate occasions, meeting them in chow halls, control centers, yes, even armored carriers and helicopters, those enthusiastic young men and women yet to be born when Neil walked on the moon were mesmerized by his presence. In a typical Neil fashion, he would always walk in, introduce himself as if they didn't know who he was, shake each and every hand, and he'd always give them, hey, how are you guys doing? Asked one overwhelmed, inquisitive Marine, Mr. Armstrong, why are you here? Neil's thoughtful and sincerely honest reply was because you are here. Neil was special to these young kids and to a few 
old ones as well. Although deeply proud to be a naval aviator, as a civilian at the time he flew, Neil never received his astronaut wings. It was a tradition of those in the military. It was on the USS Eisenhower back in 2010, on our way to Afghanistan, that Neil finally received, did receive the tribute that he deserved, his visibly, visibly moved response said it all, and I quote, I've never been more proud than when I earned my Navy wings of gold. And I've got to believe that there's a few golden eagles in the audience who will second those words. Trying to get in at Neil's inner self was always a challenge for almost anyone, maybe everyone. Asked one day by a stranger, Mr. Armstrong, how did you feel when looking for a place to land on the moon with only 15 seconds of fuel remaining? And only the way Neil could, and I know some of you have seen him this way, he put a thumb on an index finger, he tilt his head and sort of put his hand down there and he'd say, well, when the gauge says empty, we all know there's a gallon or two left in the tank. <laughs> now there is a man who has always been in control of his own destiny. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is vintage Neil Armstrong. Fate looked down kindly on us when she chose Neil to be the first to venture to another world and to have the opportunity to look back from space at the beauty of our own. It could have been another, but it wasn't. And it wasn't for a reason. No one, no one, but no one could have accepted the responsibility of his remarkable accomplishment with more dignity and more grace than Neil Armstrong. He embodied all that is good and all that is great about America. Neil, wherever you are up there, almost a half a century later, you have now shown once again the pathway to the stars. It's now for you a new beginning. But for us, I will promise you, it is not the end. And as you soar through the heavens beyond where even eagles dare to go, you can now finally put out your hand and touch the face of God. Farewell, my friend. You have left us far too soon. But we want you to know we do cherish the time we have had and shared together. God bless you, Neil. Let me.
Armstrong family, let me express the deep sympathy of all of, of us who gather here today. A wonderful, loving husband and a devoted father has been taken from you, and a hero has been taken from the country he loved inspired. I'm honored that you've asked me to say a few words about Neil today. The Neil Armstrong I knew was not the legend of public perception, the mythic figure. He was a friend. He was a regular guy, somebody you played golf with somebody you skied with, somebody you vacationed with. Uh, he was the guy who cared deeply about his family and about his community and about his many friends. When you played golf with him, though, he, he never got far from being the engineer. You'd wait for him to putt. He'd survey the line to the hole. He'd measure the dew on the green. And you sometimes wondered, Neil, are you ever going to hit the ball? He couldn't help being the engineer. Uh, I got to know him as a man with an unusually clear and strong sense of his calling in life, not as a world-famous astronaut, but rather as a Purdue University-trained engineer dedicated to advancing the science of flight. He was truly the self-described pocket protector, slide rule kind of a guy immensely proud of his chosen profession and immensely proud of his alma mater. But he was always in his heart of hearts that little boy who whittled wooden model airplanes on that small farm in central Ohio, who built his own wind tunnel by the age of 12, and whose excitement over aviation never waned. I think he indeed had been put on earth to fly. Remember his reply when somebody asked him what it was like to walk on the moon? Well, he said, you know, 
pilots really prefer to fly, that's, that's Neil Armstrong. I knew him in another role, serving on corporate boards, and boy, he was an unfailingly diligent, effective board member. In fact, the best audit committee chairman uh, I ever saw. With him in that seat, with his studious ways, his careful, cautious ways, his analytical approach to everything, you could be sure the company's books were in pretty good shape. And to the great comfort of the rest of us on the board, you could be sure there wouldn't be any surprises. Neil didn't like surprises. So while I knew Neil as a, a regular guy, his, uh, his epic accomplishment defined him to the world at large. Everywhere he went, people recognized him and wanted to to be seen with him, and he was unfailingly gracious. He's long been hailed as a national hero, but knowing Neil is to appreciate that he was the most reluctant of heroes. It was something he, he never sought, the public spotlight. And try as he did to deflect the credit and attention to others, the role of national hero, first man, nonetheless fell to him. And I think we as a nation can be thankful that it did. Because with his uncommon humility and grace, Neil captured the very best in the American character. And he put it on display for the whole world to see. He's now slipped the bonds of earth once again, but what a legacy he's left. May God bless Neil Armstrong, and may God bless the country he loves so well.
When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works, and give glory to your Father in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, amen. Please be seated. The little prince lay down and wept at the sight of 500 roses in a garden. You see, on the planet he ruled, he had a single rose who had told him that she was unique. And yet here were 500 roses, just like her, in one garden. I thought I was rich, he thought sadly, with a flower unique in all the universe. Then the little prince met a fox who taught him an important lesson about love. To me, the fox said, you are nothing more than a little boy who is just like a thousand other little boys. I have no need of you, and you have no need of me. But if you tame me, then we shall need each other. To me, you will be unique in all the world, and I will be the same for you. The little prince returned to the garden of 500 roses and realized for all their beauty, he felt nothing for them. But he loved his rose far away on his tiny planet, the rose he watered and sheltered and cared for. It's the time you wasted on your rose that makes her so important, the fox told the little prince. You are responsible for your rose. It's a peculiar sensation to watch the earth sink away and become smaller and smaller. Neil Armstrong told the graduating class of Miami University in 1970. During a trip to the moon, you see that the earth is in fact a three-dimensional globe and you appreciate the brilliant colors, the hues of the oceans and the whites of the clouds, the little bit of green that you see along the shorelines and the river basins soon disappearing. And an old statistic vaguely remembered from our grammar school days reappears and we realize that 
only 10% of the land of the earth is arable. And now we have a striking vis visualization that that is a fact. And the continents become tan and brown and red. The geographic features fade, leaving only the continental forms as you depart farther from earth. No national boundaries can be seen. And the globe becomes smaller and smaller. And then you remember another statistic. It holds three and a half billion people. And of that three and a half billion, one half are hungry and two thirds live in poverty. And you shudder to think that this problem will be much worse during the remainder of our lifetime. And at the end of the century, the population of the earth will be six or seven billion. To solve the problem, he went on, of feeding this population and protecting this planet, for the use of that population is going to take an international approach far beyond any cooperative effort ever seen in history. Then, in character, characteristically understated candor, and reflecting the turmoil of that particular moment in our history, exactly one month, you recall, after the killing of four college students at another Ohio campus, he said, I suppose we have to ask ourselves whether international cooperation on this scale is even possible. We are responsible for our roads. And today we honor and give thanks for a man who knew that everything worth striving for, every dream we pursue, every adventure that beckons and every challenge that calls forth our greatest efforts cannot be accomplished alone. Why did you walk away from the public adulation? He was asked in more ways than we can count. Why didn't you bask in the limelight as long as you could? Because, he said, I didn't deserve it. And I'm convinced that wasn't simply an expression of good Midwestern modesty, an attempt to minimize his own passionate ambition, his commitment to discipline, hard work, rigorous intellectual study and physical training, and an overwhelming sense of awe and possibility of what, what, per, what one person can in fact accomplish. He knew all that, but he spoke the truth. No one goes to the moon alone. No one accomplishes anything of lasting value in any human endeavor alone. Neil Armstrong wanted us to know that. It wasn't about him. As others have said, it was about all of us. It's been said that each person has in our life, we can hope this is true, that each one of us gets one moment of insight, our burning bush, if you will, an otherworldly, time-stopping experience that somehow succeeds in getting through to us, the insight that if we let it, will carry us through and set the course of our life. And in reading the many public tributes to Neil Armstrong, it's obvious that we all assume that the defining moment of his life was those amazing two and a half hours on the moon. How could it be otherwise? It was, after all, a first, a giant step, but we know well that he tended to downplay the impact of that experience. Once, when he was speaking to a group of students and he was asked, perhaps for the millionth time, how walking on the moon changed his life, he replied that because of walking on the moon, he got to go to a lot more press conferences at which people asked him how the moon changed his life. <laughs> but then he went on to say, never to miss an opportunity, he went on to say that when he was a kid, about the same age as the students asking those questions, no one had ever flown a plane at supersonic speed. There was no space program. 
going to the moon was pure science fiction, in the first half of his lifetime, everything changed. And he said to them, opportunities will be available to you that you cannot imagine. Now, last week in this cathedral, Mr. Vance Wilson, who's the headmaster of St. Albans School, one of the schools of this cathedral, addressed the students, all boys, in their opening chapel. And he drew their attention, as one of the other speakers did, to the beautiful stained glass window on the south side of the chancel that's known as the space window. And at its center is a rock from the moon presented to the cathedral by the three men of Apollo 11, one of whom, Mr. Collins, who graces us here with his presence, is, I might add, a St. Albans graduate, class of 1948. Mr. Wilson also mentioned in a way that would have pleased Neil Armstrong to no end, he mentioned his, NASA's historic landing of Curiosity on Mars this summer and the endlessly fascinating stream of photographs available to us now on our computers. Gentlemen, Mr. Wilson said, how about beginning this school year with a dream? Ever thought about being the first human being to walk on Mars? Why not? You wouldn't be the first St. Albans graduate to do the impossible. You better get started, though. If you leave today, it'll take you the entire school year to get there. And so without question, walking on the moon confirmed for Neil Armstrong the importance of a dream a compelling vision that propels us as individuals and a nation and a species where we've never been. And it pleased him whenever his examples and the words of his family inspired young people around the world to work hard to make their dreams come true, to be willing to explore and push the limits and to selflessly serve a cause greater than themselves. And that cause, I suggest to you, for Mr. Armstrong, was not exploration for exploration's sake, but for the survival of the only planet we human beings call home. I wonder if the defining moment for him, judging from the way he chose to live his life after Apollo 11, was when he looked out his spacecraft window and he said, it suddenly struck me that that tiny pea, pretty and blue, was the earth. That I could put up my thumb and shut one eye, and then my thumb blotted out the planet earth. And I didn't feel like a giant. I felt very small. Very, very small. The earth was his rose, and it's our rose too. Space exploration was for him but one way we human beings might marshal the best of who we are and learn the cooperation that will help us, save us from ourselves. He experienced the world, you see, coming together through space exploration. During the flight of Apollo 11, he said, I sincerely felt I had the good wishes of people from every country around the world. And even more compelling, he also saw that same global spirit as the world held its collective breath as the astronauts of Apollo 13 climbed into their lunar lifeboat Aquarius and safely returned to the Earth. And during that return, he said, worldwide offers of cooperation came from a dozen nations, including the Soviet Union, our great space competitor. The concerns of our fellow human beings during Apollo 13 are evidence that we can pursue common avenues of international interest, not only in space, but here on Earth. And so today, as we sit in this place to honor Neil Armstrong with our words and our prayers, I invite you to imagine in your mind's eye that peculiar sensation he described of watching this earth become smaller and smaller, to see 
the thin strips of green around the oceans of blue, and to remember that all the world's populations depend on those strips and the small patches of brown that are quickly now disappearing from your view. You can no longer see all that divides us as a species, only our common fate as those who call this breathtakingly beautiful spinning planet our home. You and I are responsible for our rose. And in quiet like wonder and fierce determination, Neil wanted us to know that and to work together as we must to solve the heartbreaking challenges and consider the breathtaking possibilities of our species. But remember, in the words now of the 20th century American theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, remember that nothing worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime, and therefore we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history, therefore we must be saved by faith. And nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we must be saved by love. We thank you, most merciful God, for the faith, hope, and love of one Neil Armstrong. And as best as we are able, we commit ourselves this day to his inspiring and humble example. Amen.
us to us, O oh God, the moon that is above us, the earth that is beneath us, the friends who are around us, your image deep within us. Amen. Creator of the universe, your dominion extends throughout the immensity of space. Guide and guard those who seek to fathom its mysteries. Especially, we thank you this day for your servant, Neil Armstrong, who with courage and humility first set foot upon the moon. Following his example, save us from arrogance, lest we forget that our achievements are grounded in you, and by the grace of your Holy Spirit, protect our travels beyond the reaches of the earth that we may glory evermore in the wonder of your creation. Through Jesus Christ, your word, by whom all living things came to be, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We pray, most gracious God, for your continued blessing upon those whose hearts and minds are restless until the vision of Earth from the moon as a gentle Eden becomes more and more a reality. All these, our prayers, we offer in the name of the Prince of Peace, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
Go forth into the world in peace. Search the cosmos. It is the Lord's. And may the God of all strength nerve you with the courage of the astronauts. Behold the face of Christ in your neighbor. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you, go before you, and surround you, now and always.